This is a conversation with Mario Silva. He's an actor and a realtor. He's a graduate from the Lee Strasberg Theatre and Film Institute and one of the most talented actors in the region. In this conversation, we discuss method acting, Lee Strasberg, Stella Adler and Meissner acting techniques and the differences between all of them, his acting inspirations and also emotional recall. This is no time. If you like what you see, then do hit subscribe on YouTube. Smash that button. Sorry. Follow on Spotify or rate five stars on Apple Podcast. This project continues to take a lot of my time, money and effort down to our last pennies here. So if you'd like to see it continue, do consider making a donation on Patreon. Thank you to the people who continuously do so. For other forms of love and support, you can follow this channel on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, Reels, whatever new social media platform that comes up next or Facebook copies, or you can follow me personally. And now, hi guys, it's Rithik Roshan. Absolutely fantastic. You're listening to No Time. So Vincent Donofrio, who played the role of Private Lennon Lawrence or Goma Pai in Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket, he once said that the search for truth is not for the faint-hearted. And most actors say that good acting is all about finding the truth behind a character, being honest and authentic to the character and the story. Even Vincent Donofrio in Full Metal Jacket, he played one of the most chilling portrayals of the consequences of war, military, or even abuse and bullying, and then, and finally a mental breakdown. And apparently he went so deep into finding the truth behind his character, finding the honesty in that performance, went so deep into method acting that Matthew Modine, who played Joker in that movie, wanted to actually kill him on set. So my first question for you is, is it true? Is acting not for the faint-hearted? 100%. You know, I think that is one of the things that was the scariest going into acting as a profession. Because... If you want to be serious about the work, and I and I remember in the masterclass with D'Onofrio, he talked about this, and it also reminded me of a, of a quote uh, from Brando as well, which is literally like when you're searching for the truth for something. I mean, usually in life, when you're searching for the truth, and if you're searching really deep, it's like there's a reason why that truth is hidden, you know. Uh, and then once you find it, it's difficult to cope with with that reality. There's a lot of things in life that we don't understand because we probably can't cope with the reality of it. But it's uh, it's very true, man. Like uh, the way he would describe his uh, his approach to performances, to character work, it was extremely and utterly dedicated. That it makes you wonder how how much can your mind keep up with, because you are consciously doing a lot of things to push yourself but you don't really know if your mind is going to keep up. And to go back to the quote from Brando, he said uh, one time, and I'm paraphrasing here, because it, one of, it was actually one of my teachers who worked with him at the actor's studio, even though he wasn't in the actor's studio, but you know, obviously they were all close back then. He said that when he, when he was uh, working on a character and he felt utterly exhausted and depleted, he said, that's when you keep going. That's not when you stop. That's when you keep going. Like you deteriorate yourself and you're just utterly exhausted and you feel like you're incapable of, of, of continuing. That's when you keep going. You know, there's no limit, basically. Like there is no limit. And if you're not willing to put all that up, then you are going to begin to question a lot of things regarding your commitment to the craft, which again is really scary because... When you are a teenager, especially, and you hear all these stories about all these actors doing all this, you know, all this crazy shit and, and, and going really deep into discovering something and then there are certain consequences that come behind it, it's 100% true. And when Vincent D'Onofrio, he's such an inspiring individual, probably the most inspiring actor that I've come across because I actually met him in, in person and I worked with him one-on-one. -on -one. And yeah, he said, that. I remember he said one thing to me that will always uh, stick by me. And he, we were working on a scene. I was, uh, had the pleasure of working with his daughter, uh, Leila D'Onofrio. And we're working on this scene and, and it was so hectic. And I remember, man, that week, it was such an intense week because we had the master class. And then at the end of that master class, we had our final conservatory performance. And I have never been so afraid to perform as in the conservatory performance not because they had industry agents coming in or 
you know, all our teachers were there. No, it was worse. All of our actor friends were going to be there. So it's like this 200 seater and all of the people who study here are going to be there. And when you want to know judgmental individuals, <laughs> forget critics, man. Actors. Absolutely. Because they're going to be sitting there gonna be, and they are going to look for every little thing that you miss or that you don't do or that you drop out of character. And they'll be like, there it is. So that's why for me, that was hectic. See, I didn't care about the, the industry professionals there. It was, it was great for me. It really was purely because all of the, and I had been to conservatory performances before. I have, I've been to plays before with other actors, and that's the first thing they'll talk about when they step outside. Everything you did wrong, everything that went wrong, you know? Unless, of course, you really wow them, and then you can somehow magically keep their mouth shut for maybe five minutes, and then they'll start, you know, picking what, what they believe should have been, uh, could have gone better. So it was such a hectic week for me, man. And my, my head, I mean, honestly, I think I was um, just in a constant state of, of anxiety for that entire week. And luckily, the role that I was playing uh, on for the scene study in his, in his master class, I mean, the guy was an absolute and utter mess. So it was really great because I got to just release all of that in, in the scene. But he did tell me, like, that I have to put that kind of effort into all my other like into every single performance no matter how big how small because it, and he said this he said this specifically to me because he was like i can tell that sometimes like you just don't you don't want to work <laughs> and it's a shame <laughs> because like well a lot of actors they don't put in the work but yeah. he's like he told me one time he was like man if you ever if you ever come and work with me on screen and you come unprepared i'm gonna eat you alive and i'll never forget that because that is a bigger fear than anything else, in my opinion, to be eaten alive in a performance, you know? Interesting you mentioned all the actors judging you. Uh, it reminds me of a joke where it said that how many actors does it uh, take to change a light bulb? And it says 100 because one to change the light bulb and 99 to stand around saying, I deserve that role. Or right? I could have done it. Yeah, I could have done it. Yeah. One thing I want to touch upon is you mentioned the fear of being afraid of going on stage because of uh, how the audience might react, how your peers might react. But when it comes to roles in particular, have you ever been afraid of taking up a role? Because why I say this is a lot of actors say that all the roles they do, parts of it stay behind, you know, traces of a character always stay behind within you. Are you have you ever been afraid of taking up a dark role on the, on the premise that maybe parts of that dark character might stay back with you? You know what? Um, yes, it does take a big emotional toll on you uh, especially after Danny and the Deep Blue Sea man I was so sad and depressed like honestly that, but I think it was just because like of all the plays coming up that I was doing because I did Man with the Flower in His Mouth just before that which was which was devastating I mean I, I didn't sleep I think I had like three hours of sleep per night um, leading up to the performances I was sleeping on the floor you know uncomfortably the sleep deprivation was really, was really, it was hurting me. <laughs> this wasn't intentional? Um, not really. It was kind of inevitable. I couldn't help it. I couldn't sleep very well because I was thinking about the performance. And it just didn't feel, for some reason, it didn't feel right sleeping on a bed. <laughs> and I was just sleeping on the floor. Um, I would just basically like set down um, my cover, just set it on the phone. I would just sleep on it. And even when I would get tired, I would just put an alarm on because I didn't want to sleep too long. I, it was just, it, there was just so much to think about, you know. It was like because of the character dying and everything, I, I kind of felt like there was a lot of things that I, that we take for granted in life. And, you know, I'm thinking about like how can an individual like that go to sleep and wake up? Now, obviously, for, for him, you know, he wants to live. He wants to be alive. But it's like, it's like a paradox because he knows he's going to die. But he wants to live. And it, and it hurts him. And his wife, his wife ch chases him around because she wants to die with him. And he's like flabbergasted. He's like, how, how could this woman be ready to give up her life? And I'm here 
begging for almost begging for mine, trying to come to acceptance that, that this is ultimately his fate. So I don't know, man. Some, sometimes when it comes to preparation, something feels right in order to prepare for it. And I just go with it. Um, I try it. And if, it, if I think it's helping, I, I stick with it. And that's one of the things that, that, that helped. But unfortunately, of course, there's like, you know, my personal life. It does get in the way of my personal life because I still have things that I got to do on, on a regular basis. And then after that, I jumped straight into Holmes and Watson, which luckily wasn't that... Um, it wasn't that it wasn't that harsh um emotionally um, yeah emotionally yeah, yeah, yeah. mentally um but then i jumped straight into danny and the deep blue sea after that so yes i was very depressed uh that weekend and then i think when i wrapped things up with danny just before i did tell um the cross bronx crew like lydia and satya was like man can we just do a comedy next <laughs> like <laughs> like let's just do something that doesn't require screaming or crying for you <laughs> because you need it actually i ne i need it because also like i want to enjoy it i want to have fun so right. like if i if i do another drama it's not like it's not going to be fun but i want to also go somewhere where we can just i mean just just really focus on making people laugh something lively something it's it's fun to play around with that too you know i don't want to just be the guy who like oh yeah yeah if we go if we go watch him, he was just crying and, and, and raging on stage. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I want to be able to provide different different colors. That's another reason. why it's not, it's not just because, like, oh, let me try comedy. No, no, I want to do comedy as well. I'm, I'm very much open to it. Um, it's difficult to pick the right one, if I'm being honest. But also, I kind of feel like I needed a break from all day that's interesting can we explore that for a moment because for the longest time and i mentioned this in my episode with farzana as well that i have this feeling that hollywood and oscars they always have a lust for people who play crazy roles you know yeah something like what joaquin phoenix did for joker it was an amazing performance yeah but the moment he even took up the role you knew that he's gonna get a nomination for sure you know exactly and i feel like the same amount of respect is not given to just someone playing like a best friend you know or next door neighbor or even just a, a comic role where he's just there to make, like what Adam Sandler, obviously I'm not comparing him to Akin's performance, yeah. but I feel like you might require the same kind of intensity and the same acting range to be able to pull that off um, successfully. And also to make it believable. Sometimes I feel like it's even harder to, in fact, make people laugh or just come across as an ordinary person yeah. or someone, yeah. just like, you know, like a friend or just a buddy in the movie. Yeah. To provide that intensity, I feel like you have to put in a lot of work. Absolutely. I mean, the thing is that the reason why I feel like it's um, it's not as appreciated is because usually when people go for something comedic, they cast an individual who's very natural with it. So, for example, if you look uh, super bad, you've seen super bad, yeah. right? Amazing movie. The script is brilliant. It's one of my favorite coming of age movies. Probably actually it's my favorite coming of age movie. Um, and but the actors, they're very good, but they're very natural. That's their natural ability. They can do that really well. And the script is so well written. Right. So that's why I feel like that is less appreciated because it comes off more natural. Now, when it's a dramatic role, you don't usually have an actor being like, oh, but he's like that in real life, despite him being like that in real life. Because it's more out there, because it's more like in your face, yeah. then that's where it that that's where it kicks in. That's where you're like, oh right, but he stepped out of the norm to go about it. But if you do have like a comedic genius, like Charlie Chaplin, for example, I mean that guy. When you watch his performances, it is surreal how he's able to move with so much ease. Look, so I mean he does. The craziest things, but he makes it look so he's like a cartoon. That's brilliant. You know, now let's look into in a contemporary sense. Uh, Tropic Thunder, Robert Downey Jr. Comedic performance again. See, it was comedic, but he had to step out completely out of who he is so that he could get a nomination for playing Chaplin in a dramatic role and 
for playing this guy, Lazarus, or whatever his playing name is. Guy, playing, playing a guy, playing a guy. Playing a guy, playing another guy. guy. This guy's another yeah. dude. Yeah. Hot damn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you see what I mean? Like, it's it's about that range. And just even Tom Cruise in the same movie. Actually. Oh my God, yeah. he was spectacular. Right? I remember I was in the cinema and everybody in the cinema was like, who is this guy? And then at the end in the credits when they say Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise. everybody was like, oh. and I watched this with my dad in the cinema. I think I was like, what, 16 when the movie came out? 15? Man, it was, we couldn't stop laughing. I think it's my favorite comedy movie of all time. I, 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 for sure. I mean, I, every time I watch it, I find something new and I'm like this, these guys are just so committed to what they're doing. Brutal, but I love it. But yeah, that's going back to like the commitment that you put in. I think that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. So if I'm doing a role where it doesn't require that much commitment, like get him to the Greek, Russell Brand, yeah. his performance is very good. But it's just him. But that's right? him. Yeah. That's literally what he struggled with his, in his life. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to give him a nomination when it's like you're, you're playing yourself for real. You know what I mean? Now, if it's somebody else that takes on that role, somebody who you were like, where did that guy come from? You know, that's where I guess the appreciation can, can come in sooner. That's very interesting. Let's dive further into that. Uh, and also wanted to pick your brains on acting techniques. So of course. you have attended Lee Strasberg Theatre and Film Institute and studied under Vincent Donofrio as well. Yeah. Uh, Lee Strasberg was the man behind method acting. And he used to often say that actors need to try and find points of similarity between a character and their own life and try to use emotional recall and self-analysis and their own memories to be able to create those emotions on stage. So if there's a character who's sad, then you need to equate that with a life occurrence, which was also sad in your life, and then use that. And then this is like a boxing match, and you have strong opponents of this technique, and we have Stella Adler on the other hand, who always says that your own life is not enough, and you don't have the enough range of emotions to actually portray it on screen, and you need to use your imagination and also research to be able to actually do a character well. So I wanted to uh, check with you, what has worked better for you? Have you always on stage tried to resonate more with your own life? Or are you someone who likes to do his research as well before he goes on stage? So <clears throat> I believe that, I mean, when I take on a role, I need, to, I need to do some research in it. Despite how much I think I know about the role, I need to make sure that I, that I look at, that I look at, that I can be really honest with the individual. And not and try to try to grab certain realities and keep them there. And yes, it's good to play with the imagination too. But see, here's the thing: um, it all started like the acting techniques, as you know. It all started with Stanislavski, right? The thing about Adler is that she was the only one who actually studied with Stanislavski. And these guys, man, like these guys are. These Russian actors, man, they, they're really something else. Um, at least uh, back in the day, um, they were just extremely committed to the artistic aspect of it. And Strasberg really respected that because he wanted to put that. That's why he started the actor studio and the group theater in America because he was influenced by, obviously, Stanislavski to do this. Again, Adler was the only one who actually studied with him. What Strasberg did is he studied Stanislavski's technique and he added what he thought Stanislavski was missing. But the most important thing that people always forget is that, like you said so yourself, you were like, oh, what's required to do? Oh, is this enough? Oh, is this not enough? It's just medicine. I, I promise you, acting techniques are nothing but medicine. That means that if you're not sick, you don't take medicine. So if I get a role and I'm like, oh, I can do this. Oh, when he says this line, I need to cry. I can do that because this line makes me want to cry. So what the hell do I need to do anything? I don't got to do anything. I just got to do it. Now, if I'm having trouble with a line, oh, and this line, you know, he's, he's breaking up with, with his girl. And I don't understand how could he possibly do that to her? All right, well, let's do some research. Now let's look at some techniques to help me deliver that. Because at the end of the day, I got to deliver what it says on the script. People are paying money to see this, right? The director says, all right, cool. I understand your frustration or your concerns, but you got to have to do it because this is the play. And you got to do it. That's when the techniques come in. 
That's when everything kicks in that you start using. Emotional memory, sensory work, all of animal exercises. All of this is when you're struggling. Or if you want to bring an extra layer of authenticity into the performance, then of course you work a little bit further with it. I like to do it. I like to, to include certain kinds of, I mean, sensory work just in general because it increases sensitivity um, and it makes you, it's, it's really beautiful because it, it's, you're able to relax whilst keeping the adrenaline and, and remaining impulsive. I think that's the most beautiful thing you can have as an actor. To be completely relaxed and aware of all your surroundings, but not be dead. You're, you're ready to go. It's like a highly trained like military. Like you're, you're relaxed, but you're ready to fire at any moment. You know what I mean? And that's what Strasbourg's technique taught me, that we can do that. And there's a lot of things you can do to help you commit to what you're doing. Now, with Adler, see, the thing, uh, look, I don't, I don't know them. I, I, they, they all died before I was even born. But working with people who were right next to them throughout their peak times, they told me that apparently Adler, she didn't agree with the effect of memory. She thought it was too much. It was too traumatic. That's why she went off and she wanted to do her own thing, which is the use of imagination. Yes. Buddy, everything is imagination at the end of the day. That's what makes no sense. It's like, oh, imagine that you are. Well, if I'm imagining something, it's because I've experienced it. I can't just create a unicorn from, no, unicorns already exist because I've seen one already. So I know the concept of it. So how can I imagine something out of thin air? Even if I tell you right now, imagine you're skydiving. Have you been skydiving before? I haven't. Imagine you're skydiving right yeah. now. Picture yourself jumping off a plane. Mm -hmm. You can see it. I you can, can imagine it. Why? Because you've seen other people do it. Yep. Because you understand the concept of it. That's how you're imagining it. Is that enough? No, because you don't actually know what it's like. You don't know what it's like. So that's what I'm saying. You can use your imagination all you want. But remember, even, with, even while using your imagination, it still comes from a reality that you've experienced or that you've seen. So that's why, look, there are certain people out there like Adler who was sensitive enough. She did not need effective memory. She did, and I know a lot of actresses that are like that. I know actresses that you start doing a scene and I say, shut up. And then they start crying because they're that sensitive. So what do I need to give them effective memory for? Maybe for a different... Um, because remember, effective memory is not just crying. It's laughing. It's getting angry. It's satisfaction. It's any emotion. It's just that actors always have a problem with crying. They're always concerned. Can I actually push back on that? Because Adler's not here to defend herself. I know. So I have, <laughs> <laughs> I have only one quote from her, sure. which I would love to check with you. So she had said in the past that drawing on the emotions I experienced, for example, when my mother died, to recreate a role on stage is sick and schizophrenic. If that is acting, then I don't want to do it. Do you think there's some element of truth to that? That the fact that you're reusing memories that are associated with a certain person morbidly, maybe let's say a moment of sadness in her case where her mother died. Do you think that in a way is exploiting that memory of her mother? Yeah. So here's the thing. Number one, from what I do know about Adler is that she would act no matter what, because she was one of the, the actors. Again, she's not here to defend herself yeah. and I don't know her personally, but I'm just speaking from what I've heard. So anybody feel free to correct me. But from what I heard is she wanted to be a movie star. And that's, that was uh, the group theater's problem with having her, that they knew that the moment she gets called upon Hollywood, she's going to go. So she would act nevertheless. Now, is it sick to exploit something? Absolutely. It is always sick to exploit something. But here's the thing. Don't do it then. Why would you choose that memory? There's a million other memories you could choose. And if there isn't, then don't do it. That's what I'm saying. Nobody's forcing you to do it. Now, how committed are you? Because there's people in this world that will do a lot of things inside their head that nobody else knows, but they know. So yes, is it sick as an actor to be going through something? I was talking about this with my friend and he was having an argument with this girl and they were going at it. And he told me, he was like, dude, it was so funny because the whole time while she was yelling at me, I was like, I could use this in a scene. <laughs> and I was like, yes, exactly. And he was like, yeah, man, but like, I feel so bad because she's like spewing fire at me. And in my head, I'm just like, 
It's a character that you can portray. Like, she, in his head, he's like, <laughs> in this scene, and where I gotta do Oh, this, this is gonna, perfect. He's exactly. like, what am I feeling right now? Where, where is it? The, is it in my stomach? I feel anger here in my stomach. My fists keep clenching. You know, he's oh, thinking that's about- That's amazing, yeah. You are. You are exploiting that situation. Technically, yes, you are. However, if you want to look at it in that negative sense of exploiting something, fine. I'm more, when it comes to acting and for when it comes to anything that you're passionate about, I believe everybody should always be the cup is half full. So for me, it's not about exploiting the negativity aspect. It's about embracing something positive out of it. Because in life, you're going to suffer, man, no matter what. Nobody's going to live a, a full life being like, Every single day was a perfect day for me. Nobody. It doesn't matter if you're royalty. Man, diseases will get you. Mother nature will get you. Society will get you. Any, any, they will, things will get you. So as an actor, if you're able to embrace all this negativity to use something positive out of it, why not? And that's what I mean. Sometimes I'll be deeply crying about something and I'll take a deep breath and I'll remember how I'm feeling. And I'll, and, I'll, and I'll capture it as much as I can. And then when I go on stage and I start reliving that and start feeling it again, it sort of makes me feel joy because one, it's very truthful. Two, it connects me back to that reality of whatever had happened. And I don't think it's a negative thing because despite the person that I'm thinking about, I'm connecting back with that individual. I'm creating that sense of reality yet again. I mean, there's no other profession in this world where they will tell you crying is good. Good, please keep crying. Oh my God, everybody, promotion for this guy for crying. <laughs> promotion for this guy for flipping the table in anger. But in acting, you will. You show that kind of raw emotion, that kind of, you know, reality. And people will be like, thank you. So... You could, Stella Adler could see it as exploiting. I see it as something negative turned positive. Oh, and, and the last thing about it is that, is it worth it? Well, you tell me. How great of an actor do you want to be? You could be like Seth Rogen, who takes, uh, I mean, no hate to the guy. I don't want to hate mail from Seth Rogen. He's I, watching. Good. <laughs> um, yeah. No, no, no. Here's the thing. I love the guy. I think that his movies are amazing. Same with Adam Sandler. Well, Adam Sandler, I do believe he is, he is a genius in his own way, though, um, if I'm being honest. Um, and he is a very good actor. He, he proved that in Uncut Gems. And actually in, in SNL. Love. You watched that movie? Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Paul Thomas Anderson, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also in SNL. He, he, I mean, this guy works hard. He works very hard. But again, you can choose. If you don't want, again, nobody's pointing a gun to your head, all right? If somebody gives you a role that you feel it's too much for you, nobody's telling you to do it. Go do something else. Go do some romantic comedy on Netflix that people are going to love and they're going to watch and nobody's going to get mentally affected by it. But if you want to work with Darren Aronofsky, well, <laughs> that's a different level of commitment. So that's, that's all I can say. All right. How much are you willing to put in? Because that's what's going to show at the end of the day, because we all die eventually. So eventually when you die, what do you want to be remembered for? For the easy road or the bumpy, in my opinion, inevitable road that we all go through that leaves a bigger impact. Again, I'm not judging anybody for the choices that they make. All I'm saying is nobody's pointing a gun at you. You choose what you want to choose. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. Oh, but then they won't cast me anything else. Well, then go finance your own thing and go do your own thing. Or do something in a smaller budget. I'm sorry, you can't be a movie star because it's the only job that they offered you and you, you, you rejected it because you thought it was going to do something to you mentally. Well, thank you for letting somebody else step in and take that role then. Because there was somebody out there who is willing to do it. And I don't think that's a negative thing. It's interesting you mentioned earlier that do you think it's much better for actors to actually go out there in the world, expose them to different experiences, meet new people, and as they grow as a person, they'll go richer as an actor? Or do you prefer that in comparison to just maybe going to an acting school, picking up acting techniques in isolation, learning under a mentor? Do you think growing as a person will make you a much better actor than just picking the medicine, like you said later yeah, on? Yeah, you have to do both. You have to do both. 
Um, and it's really funny because uh, we we were with the Cross Bronx was at a, an interview with a collab theater company. And um, Lydia mentioned that she said that if you have the choice to go abroad or take a job, go abroad because you learn more. I mean, I don't particularly agree with that because I will take a role over anything, <laughs> but I understand where she's coming from as in like go. Out, and it's so true. I mean, one of the reasons so I, I was in Russia like a month ago or so. One of the reasons why I went there is because I wanted to walk into, you know, the Moscow Art Theater. I wanted to go where the Russian theater was, where Stanislavski was, you know, all these, all these uh, Dostoevsky, um, Chekhov, you know, I wanted to see what they had built. And of course, that was magnificent for me. And this is something that I, no matter how many plays I do, I would have never gotten that perspective until I go there. So I do agree. However, if you have the opportunity, I'm not saying go to an acting school and get a degree. I'm saying surround yourself by committed individuals. Go to teachers who are, who are truly passionate about the craft and take a few lessons with them because you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. It doesn't matter who you are in this world and what you do in this life. Even if you don't want to be an actor, you're going to learn so much because they're not teaching you acting. They're teaching you how to understand life, how to understand yourself, how to understand human behavior more than anything. So that is something that you can use in a lot of different professions, not just in acting. So that's all I can say. If you have the opportunity to act somewhere, to go to an acting school or to take an acting course, take it. That's my opinion. Interesting, when you were talking about going to Russia and trying to experience the life that Dostoevsky or Shekhov had experienced, it just reminded me of Robin Williams in uh, Good Will Hunting. And he had said that you can read, oh, you can read all you like, but you've never actually stood in the Sistine Chapel, never and looked up, and, looked up and seen that. That's what it smells like. That's and so such true. A, such a powerful dialogue. And you see that, and that's yeah. so true. Man, I'm getting chills just from remembering yeah. that. And what? that's so true. It's man. a powerful scene. Absolutely. Yeah. And you see, that is the truth. Yeah, like I said, you can you can describe to me skydiving as much as you want, but if you haven't done it, yeah, it's a diff there has to be a difference. You you touched upon teachers teaching you not acting but how to understand life. So when you when you take up the Strasbourg technique, when you go into emotional recall, when you go into method acting, does it require you to be completely in tune with all the emotions, repressed or otherwise? Because you need to be able to have them as ammo on stage whenever you need to portray a character? You know, it's really interesting that you refer to it as ammo. Um, you know, honestly, it comes down to the fact that you should always be ready for, it, for anything. Now, when it comes to being aware, I mean, you're never going to be aware of your subconsciousness. You know, you can study it. You can have some knowledge about why you do the things that you do. But a full understanding and comprehension and accessibility by um, definition, subconscious, yeah. right? So you, what you could do is you could be deeply committed, as committed as you possibly can in the moment, and just go with it, um, which I really appreciate. That's why I appreciate Meisner, because that's what it's mainly about. It's about your commitment to what's happening in front of you and delivering that truthfully. You know, I love that. I very much love that. In term again, in terms of dealing with with like your full like traumatic experience. What what was exactly that you said again? Something about your full emotional something about going into stage with yeah, your basically if it feels like to be able to portray an entire range of emotions. You yeah. need to have analyzed your entire life, yeah, all yeah. your emotions, to yeah, actually yeah. have them as ammo, like a so, use the word. Yeah, so that was that was, I wanted to to because I wanted to quote it rather than just just paraphrase it. It depends on the role, of course. However, is it necessary? Does the role demand it? Do you think is necessary? Because if it is, then you got a lot of homework to do, man. And from what I learned in method acting school is that when you do sensory work, a lot of memories that were hidden come up because this is the way that it works. You can retrace memory with senses. Everybody knows that. Um, that's why sensory, that's why emotional memory works so well. 
because you don't think of the memory. You work on the senses. You work on what the room smelled like, what you could see, the colors, what you could feel, what you could taste, okay, what you could hear. Full description. That creates the, rea the full reality of the memory. And then, so when you're doing sensory work, certain things will come up and it will trigger certain memories. But in order to do an inventory of your entire life, man, you know what I mean? That you'll never, you'll never get there. However, again, like you said, you need an arsenal, right? So what does your character need? What do you need? Okay, have that ready. Prepare for that. Commit to that. And then whatever happens next, if I'm being honest, see what happens. And sometimes it's good to just step on stage with one objective and then see where it goes. That's fascinating. And you also mentioned the Meissner technique, which is largely based on this concept. A lot of actors talk about not being conscious when they're actually on stage because it feels like a certain energy or transit or something that takes over and in a way flows mm -hmm. through them. And I had Farzan on the show earlier and she had mentioned that there have been instances where after a performance, you would get off stage and she would pass out because it had taken so much out of her and, it, and she would not even have memory of what she had done last on stage. Has this ever happened with you where you've just felt like you're not in control of it or you always felt very hyper alert? The, the only times I'm not in control is naturally when rage kicks in. Because obviously, like, for example, I, I was doing a scene a couple of weeks ago, we were filming this movie and uh, with Megna. And uh, there's this part where I flip this table. And when the moment kicks in, so much adrenaline is rushing that when I flip that table, I do black out for a minute, for a second. Of course, because everything's happened so fast. So yes, when something happens too fast, much like in real life, I'm like, whoa. What just happened? Just muscle memory. For a second. Yeah. Yeah, 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 for a second. Because instinct kicks in and you just go with it with an impulse, right? However, stepping out of stage and being like, I don't know what just happened. That has never happened to me. Because I don't know, there people have different approaches. But my approach when I walk onto that stage is to be relaxed. Because then I can, then I can do whatever I want in character. So I remember who I am and why I'm here. And then the moment I step on stage, there's this energy. It's, it's weird to describe it, but it's like, I'm fully aware that there's 200 people watching me whilst realizing that there's an imaginary circumstances that I'm stepping into. And I need to deliver this in the most real sense, you know, for the viewer. And it's this level of, it's like, it's weird. It's like a high, you know, it's like I walk in and it's like, like I step into this bubble. Is that an instant switch? The moment I step on stage and then like I go into this bubble and I'm more relaxed than I was when I was backstage and I'm just walking on there and I'm just breathing and I'm delivering the lines and I'm listening to the to the co-actors and then no matter what happens it's not gonna make me no matter where my emotions take me it's not gonna make me lose myself because that that has happened a couple of times when I was younger and I was getting into this and then when I would watch myself I felt that there was so much that I couldn't, I couldn't change. So for example, if right now, if I was like I was 10 years ago, I would go into the scene and nothing would divert me from what I'm trying to get instead of playing around with something that could have happened. Now, what I learned later on when it was about taking control, because I remember like out of all of our method acting teachers would tell us, you cannot lose control. First of all, that's extremely dangerous, not just for you, but for the, your co-actors. You can't just lose control. You know what I mean? You can't just use that as an excuse to like jump on someone and be like, oh, I was, I was so into it. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're acting. Remember, it's not real at the end of the day. So that's why I was like, okay, how do I gather this control? How, how can I be into the scene whilst keeping control? 
And that's the ultimate paradox, which every actor hates, to be aware of what's happening while being committed to the imaginary of the situation. You know, how can I right now pretend to be flying a plane was being conscious of, of me, me as a person, pretending to be flying a plane, you know? And, and you, you need to be like right here the whole time. Literally, it's like this. This is you being conscious and this is you being committed and in the scene. And you're right here the whole time. Because that gives you the freedom to change things around, to play with other things that you naturally wouldn't have thought of because you're in the moment, but you're not only in the moment, you're aware of what's happening. And that gives you that freedom to do that. But that's just what I like to do because I like to do things differently. If I have a show eight times a week, I like to do different things in every performance for my sake, for my co-actors, for the people in the booth that have seen this 30 times. I like to do things different to each their own. If some people want to go all in and go all crazy during the scene, that's your own thing. But again, whatever works for you, whatever is going to help you deliver that performance, which you in your head think is the right one to show, because at the end of the day, it's your art. You're the one that's putting it up. You know, that's your canvas and you want to show what you believe, what is in the back of your head. Then that's what you do. All I'm saying is you don't have to. For sure. I can say that much. You don't have to lose control. It's a great exploration of different acting techniques that exist out there. And I think it's a great conversation starter for sure. <laughs> and I'm happy that you have shared it on this show as well. And I would love to see the conversation move forward because it is a fascinating field of work. And the way Thank you, you for saying that. And the way you equate it with self-analysis and also a bit of therapy, it seems like, because you have to go and really get attuned with all the emotions. It's just, man, it's very powerful. And I feel like the the glitz and the glamour of acting is showcased a lot more than the work. And like like we spoke about the fear that comes with it and the darkness that comes with it. So glad to share yeah. this on the show as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. I want to also check with you. You have worked on a lot of adaptations in the past. You've recently done uh, Holmes and Watson. In the past, you did Streetcar Named Desire. You've done Reservoir Dogs as well. A lot of Shakespeare plays. What do you find is harder? Do you think doing an adaptation where you might be rooted to a certain actor's portrayal of a character and that may serve as a frame of reference. For example, you did you played Mr. Blonde, right? In Reservoir Dogs, which is played by Michael Madsen. What a powerful performance. Do you feel that is harder because it might be hard to get it out of your mind or doing a completely new role where you're working from a blank slate? The hardest thing I've ever had to do... Well, the thing is that even if I'm doing a performance that that has been done before, like Mr. Blonde, um, it'll still be a blank slate for me. Yes, my subconscious is going to take over because I don't know. Maybe one day I'll be like, oh, I'm doing this and I, I like that. And then I'll watch the movie after the show and I'll be like, oh, that was his. And I haven't seen the, I hadn't seen the movie in 10 years, yeah. but it was there. It was there because, you know, I forgot about it, but it was there, right? Because I had seen it. Yeah. Um, but either way, I always try to, to start from scratch. However, it is very annoying once you have a a certain image of something to get that out of your head. When you've seen somebody else perform something in a certain way, and with the man with the flower in his mouth at the beginning, that was difficult because I had seen that Italian guy do it like three or four times. And it was so many things, the pacing of it, it was so, it took me like, honestly, I think it took me like a month just to, just to flip the pace because it was so locked in the way I had seen him done it, that the way he did it was all like, lethargic and like I'm gonna and I was like I can't do that so I had to go into further analysis to to find the root of of my own reality as to why he says the things that he says and that's when I had to come and I had and you know you have to completely switch that up and now you have to believe that to a hundred percent so that you can deliver in that certain way not in the fact of like no 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 this is the way it's supposed to be done because that's the way you saw it so that's very difficult it is it is. I'm not going to lie. But at the end of the day, it does not matter. Um, whether it's a performance that I've done before, 
that, that somebody's done before or not, it does not matter. Um, because at this day and age, 2021, the performance probably has been done by somebody else. And even if it's yeah. brandly new written, well, there's something very much like it. There's something very much, there's an actor who has performed something, and that's of all time. You know, since the beginning of uh, theater, somebody's been doing something that was clearly done before. That's why they did it to begin with, because they were influenced by that reality. Do you think so? Do you think nothing is created fresh or brand new? And it seems like creativity is rather just picking up inspirations, maybe subconsciously, yeah. and then putting a bit of your own personal flair and your context into it. But it's not about creating something that's never been done before, but in fact, taking all of it together, making an amalgamation that's never been yeah. seen before. So that's the thing, right? That you, That's where your, crea your creativity needs to kick in. So if you are able to take, you know, red and blue and mix it together, you've created purple. And if nobody's ever seen purple before, yes, you are given the credit for creating purple, but you used blue and red, which were there before. Without blue and red, you would have never been able to create purple. So I'll give you credit for creating that color, but you use two real things to create something new. That's what I'm talking about. No matter who you are, it came from your being creative of something else. And you brought that into the table. See what I mean? So even, th even new concepts, even new things that are coming around and people are like, wow, he invented that? Yes, from his imagination, from a certain reality that he experienced and he could visualize, he or she could vis visualize. And that's my take on that. I still give full credit to everybody. I give full credit to Marlon Brando for the way that he basically innovated acting. But again... It all comes from something that trigger that creativity so that it could become what it is nowadays. Speaking of inspirations, so you're a realtor by day and an <laughs> export tour guide by the yeah. afternoon, actor by <laughs> night. Actually, I don't know how you segregate the professions by day, evening or night, but, right, right. but you do wear multiple hats. I'm sure there are a lot of benefits of theater and acting that you can take into real estate as well, because a lot of it is telling a story and putting on a show and closing <laughs> the deal. But have you, in fact, found any benefits from being a realtor or being a guide that you've taken back into acting? Um, definitely the, the tour, the tour guide, um, because they give you a script. So, you know, it's like, you know, playing with the script and, and I've done interactive theater, so, yeah. so it wasn't that difficult. Um, with real estate, I guess I, I wouldn't give credit to acting for real estate in all honesty. I kind of feel like my, um, like I've, all, I've, I've liked being, I've always been outgoing. I always like to talk to people. I always like to, to listen and, 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 you know, respond to people. Yeah. So I uh, kind of, I mean, if anything, the reason why I can do, I can teach, I can do real estate. I worked at the expo. It's probably the reason why I can be an actor. Because I can do many things. I've done many things, many different jobs in my life. And that's probably why I chose to be an actor ultimately. Because of the fact that I like to wear many hats. Yeah. <laughs> I like to wear many hats. or I like to do different things. Do you think the fact that you're exposed to so many different people, especially as a guide, that you meet so many people on a daily basis, does it allow you to stay rooted and maybe pick up on nuances that you can then put into your acting as well? Yeah, that was, well, actually, um, so the expo job, I only did it before COVID. Um, so I haven't done that in a while, even though I did meet really nice, interesting people. But where I've met the most interesting people is teaching English. I've met people from Saudi, from Turkey, from Taiwan, from Korea, from Germany, from Russia, that is by far the most interesting job I've ever had in terms of the people I meet. It really is spectacular to get to experience how to communicate with people who have different beliefs than you, who were built differently, who understand realities different, you know, um, who can be judgmental about certain things, which in your eyes would be like, why would you take that personal? You know what I mean? 
So I think that's definitely one of the most interesting things I've ever had and, and potentially one of the things that would be most useful to acting. Quite intriguing, actually. Yeah. <laughs> okay, before we start wrapping up, I would love to get your thoughts on who do you think are some of the best actors out there right now? And Alive or dead? <laughs> either works. Alive, Marlon Brando. There's without a doubt in my mind that Marlon Brando is Sorry, the alive? actor. Isn't he dead? Yes, he's dead. That's yeah. what I mean. So like alive or dead. Yeah. So Brando, without a doubt, the greatest actor that has ever lived, uh, that we've seen on screen, or some people who've been fortunate enough to watch him in theater, without a doubt. He completely changed the concept of acting in Hollywood. And every single actor you see today is the way they are because of him, undeniably. Um, he's a huge inspiration to me in terms yeah. of his commitment, in terms of the reality, in terms of how interesting he can be. You know, every time he's on the screen, then they change the scene. You're like, go back, go back to Brown. You know, you could watch a movie just on him. You know, that's how interesting his behavior is. And then he influenced a lot of actors that we highly respect nowadays. So alive, who would you pick alive? The greatest actor that's alive probably jack nicholson or de niro i'm more of a de niro fan but i like to see it's very hard to compare actors unless you see them on screen together but even then it depends on on the role uh they did this movie together de niro and and, and nicholson um, and Nicholson was more interesting in, in one particular scene that, that, that I can think of. But again, that was just because of, I, I thought the character was more interesting, not because De Niro wasn't doing his job because De Niro is, you know, he's yeah. De Niro. Um, so it's really hard for me to always pick between the two because, so let, let's look at their best performance. Let, let's, let's look at it that way. That's, that's a way better analysis, I guess, because there's a lot of actors out there that you could judge them on one movie. And I'll be like, wait, wait, wait. Well, let's talk about the best he's ever done. What is De Niro's best? Probably The Godfather. The second movie. The second one? Yeah. Uh, or Raging Bull. Hmm. Not Maybe many people Raging would put Bull. Godfather Part 2 actually as De Niro's best oh performance, God, right? Yes. They would rather put Taxi Driver or they would put the thing Raging that, Bull as well. You know, actually, the thing is that Taxi Driver is... Unbelievable, obviously. The reason why I love Godfather Part Two is because he took Brando's character, making it his own, while staying true to the evolution of what he would become at the end. It is brilliant. It is so true and honest. And he was following the footsteps of the acting God, literally. And he did it so subtly so beautifully so real but now that we're talking about like i guess maybe unpopular opinions my favorite de niro performance is in mean streets his character is on point there's not a single moment where i'm looking at him and i cannot picture that being a real human being it's like i know this guy it's like i've seen that guy walking around in the bronx or or harlem you know what i mean yeah. He's so real. And he's not like that at all. He's not this outgoing guy who must know. He's like this totally shy guy, you know, like De Niro. Everybody knows that about him, right? Like he's very quiet and stuff like that. He kills it, man. He, I mean, he, honestly, he's, he's an unbelievable actor. But Jack Nicholson, my favorite performance from him is One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And it's very hard to find a performance that's better than that. It's so, I mean, besides Brando, of course, it's so unbelievably good. Honestly, I, I cannot even describe with words right now because it would take too long if I get into that <laughs> of how surreal that guy is playing uh, McMurphy. McMurphy, I think is his name. Anyway, man, it's so beautiful. Everything he does, when, when, he, <laughs> when he gets to the doctor's office and they analyze him and they're like, but you don't look crazy. And he's like, what are you going to do, doc? And he's yeah. like, man, it's so, he's so good. He's so good. I love him, man. Um, and no, I mean, dude, there's a, there's a lot of 
amazing, brilliant actors there nowadays. So many, so many, yeah. It's interesting, you mentioned uh, comparing actors when they actually go, I mean, are in a scene together. And the one scene that really stands out for me is the movie Heat with Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. And they only meet twice in the movie and once in the middle and once in the end. And the once in the middle is like this coming together of the two greatest actors of their generation. Yeah. And they were both fantastic. So man, then I'm getting the goose. I'm just talking about this scene. It's so beautiful, man. Oh, man. Like was... imagine seeing that. With, like everybody was like, wait, wait, wait. There's a movie coming out with Al Pacino and De Niro. Well, we're watching that. No matter what, you're watching that movie. And I thought that was that was that was incredible. Yeah. To have both of those actors who are extremely influential. I mean, when you were growing up wanting to be an actor, if you were born in like the 60s onwards, you would either be a De Niro or a Pacino. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah definitely. I, and I love Al Pacino, man. Dog the Afternoon, one of my favorite performances from him. He is truly an incredible actor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. Funny. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, yeah, big, big influence on a lot of work I've done before. What are some of the best films according to you? Well, the greatest film I've ever seen in my life, um, subjectively speaking, is The Lord of the Rings. That, uh, I'm not even joking, that is by far my favorite movie of all. I've seen it countless of times, obviously. I think I watch it at least four times a year, the extended version. Um, 12 hours every year? Yeah, every yeah. time Every time I rewatch it, it's like a new movie. You know, every t every battle scene, I'm like... The music, you know, the, the dialogue. Music. The, oh, oh, okay, so here's the thing. Guys, one more hour of just Lord of the Rings. Let's go. Yeah, you know what? Uh, <laughs> tune in because uh, go to the bathroom breaks. Right? I yeah. think, yeah, because uh, on it, well, I could talk about that for forever. But here's the thing, man. With uh, Lord of the Rings, a lot of the times when people ask me, especially when they find out that I'm serious about acting, they'll be like, okay, so what's your favorite movie? And I'm like, Lord of the Rings. They laugh. They're like, oh, no, but seriously. They expect something like, artsy. But they not, expect like, yeah, yeah, they expect me to say like the God, which I love the Godfather. Of course, I, I absolutely love that movie. But they expect me to say something like that. And I'm like, Lord of the Rings. And I'll tell you why. Not only are the books that it was adapted uh, from the greatest fantasy novel ever written, the greatest fantasy universe ever made, I mean, I am obsessed with that aspect. I think I've read anything written or inspired by Tolkien. That's how much I love this guy, right? And that's how much I respect him as well. Not only that, Peter Jackson was able to adapt it so beautifully and so fitting to the screen because everything he didn't include from the books was from a director's point of view. Clearly, this is cinema. Clearly, this is what's necessary. I completely understand. So we got the script beautifully adapted the acting is spectacular from every single actor everybody was casted so well the music the direction the special effects the makeup the cinematography the setting everything i cannot tell you a single thing where i go like the costume design yeah. it doesn't matter you name it it doesn't matter. Every single aspect from the movie is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen put together. The, and the storyline, everything, man, it just, it's so spectacular. And that's why, in my opinion, subjectively speaking, is the greatest film I've ever seen in my life. I could watch it over and over and over again, forever and ever and ever, which I will, because talking about it right now is making me want to watch it again. Same and I saw it like two months ago. We're going to do a watch party. <laughs> Honestly, that's going to be, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's, in my opinion, my subjective opinion of the greatest movie ever. One seen. of the few, or oh, I think the only movie that has actually helped a book or amplified a book. Usually it's always the book is better than the movie. The book is better than the movie. But in this case, in fact, I think I watched the movie first before. Yeah, me too, of course. Before I read the books. Yeah, yeah. yeah when I was seven or eight or yeah, something. Exactly. That's when I was like eight. Out. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then I was like, wow. And I just need to watch and read the books. And we're talking about the greatest, like you said, the greatest fantasy novel of all time. And to make a movie out of that, man, we could go all night. Exactly. And, and you know, it's actually interesting that you say that because I'll, I remember I was reading The Silmarillion, right? And it's a really big book. 
And it took me a while. So I would take it on the train with me. I would go to my friend's house. You know, I'd be reading it by the pool. And usually uh, their parents, parents would ask me, what are you reading? And I'll be like Silmarillion. They're like, oh, that's the Lord of the Rings thing. I'm like, yeah. They're like, yeah, you know, when I was reading it, I couldn't really understand it. And I was like, but did you like it? It's like, yeah, then the movies came out, everything. So I'm like, a lot of people were reading. And because it's epic fantasy, they couldn't really get it. Because the, one of the funniest things about this guy is that he's so creative that every character has like three different names. You know what I mean? Like Aragorn, for example. He's known as Aragorn. Strider. You know, a Strider. A Ranger. A, a Ranger. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like all of these different names, depending on the location. When you read the Silmarillion, that's impossible to keep up because there's like a hundred different characters and there's like four new languages that they throw in there. And you're like, wait, who are they talking about? <laughs> you know what I mean? Who's Mitrandil again? Who's, wait, wait a minute. Wasn't he just Gandalf yeah. like a couple of pages Wasn't ago? Wasn't he great? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So see, like, and, and then you watch the movie and you're like, oh, okay. You know what I mean? Because it is difficult to understand, man. It is. It, it will take you a couple of reads. But people still loved it. Despite the complexity of it, people still loved it. And I highly respect that. Yeah. And it influenced everything else that's going on around now. You've opened a can of worms with Lord of the Rings, but <laughs> we have to get out of it <laughs> because we need to start wrapping up. So before we move on to final questions, love to interpret what you've built with the Lego here. Man, honestly, it's so weird and it might sound cheesy, but we're just talking about acting and everything in general. I just started building what I could picture is like a stairway. And it is. To somewhere more beautiful <laughs> like i was trying yeah. to somehow like put this gate here like put this door here and like it would just be like a like you walk up and it's just like a gate into something i don't know why amazing yeah what did you what open did you? oh well uh, well i built this what do you think this is I, really not a stairway I, to I heaven think, i think <laughs> i think it was the beginning of a futuristic uh, spaceship that's exactly what I was that saying. That is Man. exactly what it is. Yep, I got you. Genius is always understated. That's it. You know, <laughs> okay, let's move on to our final question. So what are yeah. some... Okay, we've already talked about movies though. What are some people and books, apart from Lord of the Rings, that have strongly inspired in your life? Ooh. The Outsiders really inspired me. Uh, I love that. I love that book. Um, Fahrenheit 451. I, I love like dystopian, yeah. uh, you know, uh, m uh, books. Ray Bradbury. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, man. Uh, 1984, of course. George I George love George. it. I love that book. I see a pattern here, man. God. <laughs> yeah. You don't like the world so much. <laughs> <laughs> man, but see, the thing is that, you know what the craziest thing when I was reading 1984? Whilst reading it, I was writing the script to make the movie for it. And I have all these ideas for it. And one day I'm going to do it that way. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get to Hollywood. And one studio executive is going to be like, hey, man, here's 50 million. Make a movie. And I'm going to be like 1984. That's it? Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I love it. And it's, and it's so crazy because even in this day and age, it could happen. I have a concept on how they could do it. Basically, right now, we're all united because of social media, right? Think about how easily it would be for us to be controlled if the internet just shut down. We would all be powerless all of a sudden. You know what I mean? And it's scary because certain governments have done that. They'll shut down Twitter. They'll shut down this. Now, how are you going to communicate? You don't have to attack India like that. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> why do you, why Was that about, where I heard from? Yeah. <laughs> hmm. yeah, why? <laughs> no, but it's the power of it. That book you is know, timeless. It's, yeah. oh my, it is. That's exactly. Yeah. You see, when I was reading, I was like, yeah, but could this really happen right now? And then I heard on the news, like, so, oh, they were trying to remember TikTok when they were like, oh, in America. And I was like, oh, my God. Obviously, I've read this book multiple times, not just the one time. Because the first time I read was back in high school. I don't even think Instagram existed back then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so back then I was like, oh, yeah, this is totally possible, I guess. I don't really understand life. But then I read it a couple more times later on. Later on. And the last time I read it was, I think, like in September last year. It was before Glass Menagerie. I, I remember I was reading it because I was talking about it with one of the actresses. Um, and, and I realized that even in 2020, it could still happen, you know, and it was just really beautiful. Um, so many books, Lord of the Flies. I love Lord of the Flies. Yeah. I think that that book is incredible, uh, really influenced me. Honestly, I, I don't know, man, I could go on and on. 
Um, we we, we sense reading. the pattern. Dark <laughs> books. <laughs> what about people? Yes. Role models? My father. My father is without a doubt a, a man that I look up to and I highly respect. Um, it it really like every time I I I struggle, I just think of my dad. That that is probably the the one individual that will keep me going, you know, up here and here. You know, he's always taught me about moral compass and everything, and that, which is hard when you want to be an actor. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's not about moral compass; it's about following your gut. And he has always told me, follow your gut. Every time I tell him, like, Dad, I have two options. What do I do? He's like, which one feels right? This one feels right. But no, 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 no. There's no but. What do you mean but? That one feels right? All right. Have you been wrong before? All right. Well, if you're wrong, then guess what? Start again. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think that's the most motivational thing I've ever Shout out to course. Mario's father, Super Mario. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> the original Mario. The original Mario. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Alan Rickman once said that actors are agents of change. A film, a piece of theater, a piece of music or a book can make a difference. It can change the world. Often you find actors who actually doubt what they're doing because they say, oh, he's just putting on a show. It's all fake. It's an imaginary world. Uh, what I do is not as important as, let's say, what a doctor does, a surgeon, a soldier, a firefighter. But would you agree with Alan Rickman? Do you think what actors do actually has a lot of value in this world and it can change the world? I'm not going to disagree with Alan Rickman because... Um I respect him and I love him. He's an incredible, well, he was an incredible actor. Yeah. Um, however, I don't fully agree. And I'm not, I don't want to say, you know, I don't want to speak more than what we, what an actor actually is. But I guess it's like a magician. See, when a magician fools you, you are like, oh, how did this guy do this? Yeah. But the magician's like, man, like, this is so easy. Like, I can't believe this guy's falling for it. And acting is kind of the same thing. Like, we sort of understand where it's coming from. So because someone like him, if they're watching themselves and being like, oh, this is nothing, whatever. Because you understand, like, fully. Well, not fully, but you sort of see where you're coming from. And it's very, your perspective is very different. Now, we need doctors. 100%. We need doctors. We need lawyers. I mean, these people are out there battling every single day. And, and we love them and respect them. These people deal with a lot of uh, sadness and a lot of oppression. Sorry, not oppression. Repression, yeah. right? Because they deal with a lot of negativity. It is part of the job. So if they can go home at the end of the day and watch a movie or watch a TV show that makes them smile and makes them get close to their family, I think that, I think that we did a pretty good job if we achieved that. So I don't think it should be taken for granted that it's just acting. Everybody watches some sort of entertainment to get away from something. And acting is one of them. Some people draw, some people paint, some people listen to music, some people play music. Well, sometimes you want to come watch something that even if it's not comedic, is going to make you feel something, is going to help you find out something. You're going to watch something, you're going to be like, now I know what my problem is. Oh, I had this issue. Now by watching this, now I feel I can solve it. Oh, I couldn't speak my voice before, but this character in this movie, I saw him speak his voice and, and he inspired me and now I'm going to speak my voice. And that happens. You ever seen this movie, True Romance? Watch it. <laughs> It'll change. I mean, it's one of those movies where it's just a movie, but it sparks things in you. You know, it, it allows you to see the world. I can't tell you a single time where I've watched a good movie and I've been like, no, because I'm like, wow, now, now I understand something new. So I kind of feel like, again, I don't want to be like sucking up to myself or the professional that I want to follow for the rest of my life till I die. But I kind of feel like uh, every actor should really appreciate that they get to do something unique. And not a lot of people get to do this. Again, without the amazing, unbelievable support from my father and the rest of my family, I would struggle so much to be an actor. And there's someone, I had a student once, she was crying to me because when I told her I'm an actor, she was like, oh my God. And she started tearing up. 
And I was like, what, what's wrong? She's like, I wanted to be an actress, but my parents wanted me to be a doctor. So here I'm in, in nurse school and I'm miserable. She was tearing up, literally tearing up in front of me. And she was so happy for me. And I was like, wow. You know what I mean? So again, I'm, I'm going to take it as a cup half full. If it's anything acting related, I'm going to take it anything I can in a positive way. What would you like a legacy to be like? Um, well, if, if I'm being honest, um, I want to be respected and prestigious in the work that I do, 100%. But I don't just want to be an actor, you know. I, I also want to, I mean, it's not even about what I want to be when I'm dead. It's about who I want to influence. And I kind of feel like, you know, when you do this professionally, you can make a lot of money. And what I want to do with that money is truly and selflessly help everyone in my way in terms of health and education. I really want to leave this world with having built like schools and hospitals all over the world. And I don't know, maybe maybe attaching a family name to it just for my father's and my fa and my grandfather and, and my children, if I have children. And, and that it can influence other people to be like, hey, you know what? Let's all build schools. Let's all help people get educated and help people get healthy and, and water, just basic needs. You know what I mean? And that's really what I truly want. And I think that if I succeed as an actor, the way I vision myself, I will be able to provide all those things to society. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I can't wait. I'm looking forward to that as much as I'm looking forward to to being in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. But I'm being honest. We can't wait as well. That's a great legacy to have. Last question, Mario. What do you think is the meaning of life? Uh, well, that, that uh, what we're talking about. So that is sort of an extension of, of what I believe everybody should try to accomplish, helping everybody that comes your way. Uh, honestly, I have a, a dear friend of mine. He does that. He says, man, if I can help someone, I'm just going to do it. No questions asked. If I can, I can. If I, if I have two Lego pieces and I just need one, here you go. No questions. It doesn't matter. But most importantly, the meaning of life is it's your life. And like I said earlier, you're going to die one day. We all are. So why not do what you want to do? Forget about everybody else. Do what your heart tells you to do. As long as you're not hurting anybody or yourself. But, you know. That that's a little depends on the context, there, you know, because like if you're acting and you're, you know, taking things like uh, to another level, if you're a fighter, you know, you're hurting yourself. But, you know, you got to but you know what I mean? Like um, you got to live your life. That's the only meaning of life, in my opinion. You have to live your life, man. You have to live this life. You have to take a deep breath, feel your heart beat. Just do whatever it is that's going to make you happy today, because if not then you're living for somebody else. And that's not life, right? That's somebody else's life. Beautifully put, Mario. Thank you so My much. Man, if people you. want to connect with you online, in person, support you, watch one of your next plays, back in the do Oh, uh, my Instagram. I, I try to put everything there. Um, you know, anything that's acting related, all the projects that I have coming up, anything that I filmed before uh, at Juan Mario Silva. My full Hispanic name. That's the place <laughs> to follow Mario. Mario, thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, my man. Thank you.